Doing something that no one else has ever done is not easy. Sometimes it hasn't been done for a good reason. But just because you love something, and it should be done, does not guarantee your success. It's the smallest components of a complex structure that are impossible to make perfect. And their failure can cost you everything. Walter P. Kissler was born in 1918 in Switzerland. He studied at the University of Geneva, completing a master's degree in physics from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. He pioneered research into sensor systems, including pressure gauges and accelerometers. He was awarded the Albert F. Speary Award in 1980 for his work. Mr. Kissler moved to the United States in 1951 and joined the Bell Aircraft Company. There he built an accelerometer that was used in the guidance system of the Adreno rocket system. In 1954, he founded his own company, the Kistler Instrument Company, and developed several sensors that flew on the Apollo missions. He was awarded the Aerospace Pioneer Award for this work. He sold the company in 1968 and moved to Seattle, where he worked on other projects of interest to him. He helped several high-tech startups get off the ground, including SpaceHab. As American progress in space slowed considerably after Apollo, Mr. Kistler started to think that the solution would be a large reusable rocket system. And in 1993, he founded the Kistler Aerospace Corporation. Kistler Aerospace was planning to build this, a two-stage fully reusable rocket system called the K-1. The first stage was called the Launch Assist Platform and would have used three AJ-26 engines previously used on the Antares rocket. The AJ-26 was sold by Aerojet, but had started as the NK-33 engines in the Soviet Union. The NK-33s had been designed by Nikolai Kuznetsov and were built in the late 1960s for the Soviet moon rocket, the N-1. These engines burned RP-1 or kerosene with liquid oxygen, just like the Apollo Saturn V and the SpaceX Falcon 9. The NK-33 was a high-performance rocket engine with an excellent thrust-to-weight ratio of 137, the highest of any rocket engine at that time, and a specific impulse of 297 at sea level and 311 in vacuum. It was 3.7 meters tall with a diameter of 2 meters, compared here to the Apollo F-1 and the SpaceX Merlin. The NK-33 was a high-pressure, regeneratively cooled, staged combustion cycle engine. Stage combustion means they don't run propellant through a turbo pump, then vent it overboard, like the F-1 in Merlin, but instead burn a little fuel with the oxygen to power the turbo pump, then direct the exhaust into the combustion chamber. This system saves propellant and is more efficient than the F-1 or Merlin. American rocket scientists had thought that it would be impossible to have an oxygen-rich stage combustion system, because an oxygen-rich flame is what we call a cutting torch. Hot oxygen is one of the most destructive things known, and it was not thought that any metal could survive it. The Soviets developed new alloys to make their engine possible. Some metals are more resistant to oxygen burning than others. These include copper and its alloys with nickel and chromium. The Soviets were far ahead of the Americans in rocket science at this point in history. The reason for this mainly comes down to one name, Sergei Pavlovich Korolev. Korolev was not just a genius when it came to rocket science. He was a hands-on experimenter. Rather than debate what was possible, he ordered the construction of different designs and tested them. If some of his metallurgists felt they could make an alloy that could survive superheated oxygen, let them build it and test it. Run rocket engines until they exploded so you knew what their limits and weaknesses were. This is how the NK-33 was born. While the Americans were trying to perfect an untested design chosen by committee, Korolev was building rockets and engines and throwing them into the air. With rapid prototyping and testing, incredible progress was made by the Soviets. Korolev's successes were not because the Soviet system was better in some way, though authoritarian regimes can accomplish a lot when they are right, but no one is able to correct them when they are wrong. Korolev built the rocket that put the first satellite into orbit, but was denied the Nobel Prize when the Soviets would not disclose his identity. He put the first human into orbit, but was again denied a Nobel Prize, as he was considered a state secret. Korolev had at one point been sent to prison by the Soviets, and his health had suffered terribly. These old medical problems came back to haunt him, and he developed internal bleeding. He was rushed to the hospital for emergency surgery, 
but died on the table, and Soviet progress stagnated. Politics became involved, and one of his political rivals was put in charge. This man ordered the NK-33 engines destroyed when the N-1 was cancelled. The dedicated scientists and engineers who had worked with Korolev could not stand to see these beautiful engines lost forever. They put them into a warehouse and closed the doors. By this time, the Americans had got their program on track, and with the help of Von Braun and the Saturn V with its less efficient but much larger F-1 engines, had thundered their way to the moon. The Soviet engines stayed in that warehouse for almost 30 years, until December 26, 1991, when the Soviet Union fell. After the fall of the Soviet Union, American companies went to Russia to see what was left that might be valuable. There, American entrepreneurs found the NK-33s. The engines were sold to American companies where they were dusted off and tested. They proved to be still better than anything the Americans had yet developed. The NK-33s were refurbished, renamed the AJ-26, and put to use in the Antares rocket built by Orbital ATK. Mr. Kistler chose to use modified versions of these rocket engines in the design of his K-1. The K-1 first stage would have three AJ-26 engines in a linear pattern, seen here. These engines had a mass of 1,222 kilograms, producing 1,510 kilonewtons of thrust at sea level, and 1,680 kilonewtons in vacuum. They had a chamber pressure of 145 bar, or 14.5 megapascals. The K-1 first stage would have had a total gross mass of 250 tons, with an empty mass of 20.5 tons, leaving a propellant mass of 229,500 kilograms. The second stage would have an initial mass of 131 tons, and a final or empty mass of 13.1 tons. It would use one NK-34 engine, which is just an NK-33 with a larger nozzle, optimized for vacuum flight producing 1,769 kilonewtons of thrust with a specific impulse of 348 seconds and a burn time of 233 seconds. The payload to low Earth orbit would be 4,500 kilograms. Payload to the International Space Station would be 3,200 kilograms. And this is what the K-1 was built for. NASA had announced the Commercial Orbital Transportation Services Program in 2004, when the U.S. intended to go back to the moon by 2020 and retire the space shuttle by 2010. Private companies would then be given contracts to deliver supplies to the ISS, so NASA could focus on the moon. Kistler Aerospace felt that their K-1 would be a great option for this program. Let's evaluate this rocket for a flight to the ISS. The K-1 would have launched with an initial mass of 384,200 kilograms. Would have burned through the 229,500 kilograms of propellant in the first stage, ending with a final mass of 154,700 kilograms, providing a little more than 2.7 kilometers per second of delta V. This first stage would fall away with its 20,500 kilograms, at which time it would deploy parachutes to come back and land. Notice that the ship would be falling horizontally to increase air resistance. There would be airbags to cushion the landing. After separation, the second stage would fire with an initial mass of 134,200 kilograms. It would burn through its 117,900 kilograms of propellant mass, adding 7.2 kilometers per second of delta V. And the payload and empty second stage would be in orbit. The K-1 would have produced a total delta V of 9.8 kilometers per second, but we should subtract the 1.3 to 1.8 kilometers per second for atmospheric and gravity drag, giving us about 8.0 kilometers per second to get into orbit. Remember, we need a minimum velocity of 7.8 kilometers per second to stay in low Earth orbit. This is 28,080 kilometers per hour. The second stage would synchronize its orbit with that of the ISS and unload its cargo.
The second stage would then come back to land also, in a manner similar to the first stage. Parachutes would deploy, and airbags would cushion the landing. This would have been the first reusable orbital rocket. Full designs were completed in 1994, and subcontracts were issued in 1996. The ship was supposed to be ready by 2000, but delays held it back. It was 75% completed in 2004, when complications started to get serious. Kistler started to suffer from cash flow shortage. Space is an all-or-nothing business. You don't get partial credit for almost making it to orbit. In 2006, Kistler was chosen by NASA for funding to supply commercial services to the ISS and joined with Rocket Plane Limited from Oklahoma to produce the reusable rocket system. A much smaller and less experienced company called SpaceX was chosen to compete also. This looked like a great opportunity for Kistler and Rocket Plane and they set out to secure $500 million in private financing. But by August of 2007, they still could not get enough investment to meet the requirements. Sometimes the worst opposition is giving someone just enough encouragement that they come to trust and depend on the support. The next month, NASA pulled the agreement, and RPK had to start cutting staff. By 2009, the company had just a few employees and had to shut down its operations in Oklahoma. It had collected $18 million in state tax breaks, but it did not supply the jobs the state had hoped for. In all, over $600 million had been invested. And in 2010, rocket plane Kistler declared Chapter 7 bankruptcy with only 100000 in assets, including the K-1. It still owed about $7.4 million. In December 2011, all of the assets of rocket plane Kistler were bought by Space Assets LLC and formed into a new company. Kistler Space Systems. Other companies went on to use similar rockets to supply the ISS. The Antares rocket used an RP-1 first stage and a solid propellant second stage, both repurposed from military ICBMs. The first stage used two of the same variants of the NK-33 called the AJ-26 that Kistler would have used. On October 28, 2014, an Antares rocket lifted off from the NASA Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia. This was the third such resupply flight for the Antares rocket. Shortly after the rocket began to rise majestically into the air, something went terribly wrong, and the rocket lost thrust, falling back to the launch pad causing an incredible explosion. By analyzing the accident, NASA was able to determine that one of the turbo pumps had failed. Turbo pumps are a weak point in all large rocket engines. You have to throw massive amounts of propellant into the combustion chamber. This takes a lot of power, and the turbine blades must spin at the edge of what's physically possible. The smallest defect in an engine blade can cause a piece to break free and become a high-speed missile. Sometimes the smallest thing going wrong can destroy everything. In this case, the cargo meant for the ISS, and the safety of the engines used was brought into question. Two other engines had failed on test stands recently, and the company flying the Antares Orbital ATK had to repair the launch pad and stand down operations. NASA thought it likely that the four decades the engines had been sitting had caused imperceptible micro defects in the turbine blades to corrode. Even super alloys fail with time. The modified NK-33 was grounded. Orbital ATK was eventually able to recover. Contracting with the United Launch Alliance to send the next two Cygnus cargo ships on Atlas V rockets. Orbital then modified their ship to fly with Russian Bill RD-181 engines and went back to flying. The incident made clear to NASA that depending on the established companies was not a sure bet, and that some of the old Soviet rocket technology needed to be updated. And by then that small startup rocket company, called SpaceX, was coming along nicely. He had been able to reach orbit with the Falcon 1 in 2008, and had received a little government funding. It had launched and recovered its own space capsule by 2010, and had sent one of these Dragon capsules to the ISS in 2012. SpaceX had not bought an engine from someone else, but instead hired a genius to design their own. The Merlin engine, designed by Tom Mueller, became the only operational rocket engine in history with a higher thrust-to-weight ratio than the NK-33. SpaceX was able to help make up the shortfall from the loss of Antares in 2014 and establish itself as an innovative and successful company. As for Kistler Aerospace, this was the last nail in the coffin. So often in life, it's the little things that cause us so much trouble. The things we don't even know will be a problem. Nothing of this earth is ever perfect. Given enough time, small defects can have catastrophic consequences. How we are formed and made can, if not recognized and corrected, 
be our downfall. Kistler Aerospace had been successful for decades, founded by a brilliant man. They still have an active and updated website, but do not appear to be actively funding any projects. Mr. Kistler himself, like all human beings, was also not perfect. It was reported in 2008 by the Southern Poverty Law Center that Mr. Kistler was also the sole remaining donor to the Pioneer Fund. The Pioneer Fund had been founded in 1937 to promote the eugenics movement, which was founded in America and promoted the belief that some people were genetically more pure than others, and that those deemed less fit should be weeded out of the population. This belief became popular in America in 1910 and led to the involuntary sterilization of people deemed unworthy of reproduction. The movement led to the 1924 Immigration Act, which was designed to keep Italians and European Jews out of the United States. In the same year, the state of Virginia passed a law requiring the forced sterilization of anyone deemed intellectually disabled. It also led to a famous Supreme Court case in 1927, called Buck v. Bell, where an 18-year-old woman was ordered to be sterilized because her mother may have been a prostitute and she had been adopted. Her adoptive parents had become furious when she became pregnant. The United States Supreme Court called her an imbecile and ruled that Miss Buck was feeble-minded and promiscuous and could be forcibly sterilized, which was done. This ruling has never been overturned, by the way. The eugenics movement in the United States also inspired a little-known German radical to argue that Germany was falling behind the United States in purifying its population and creating a master race. You know the rest. The state of Virginia forced sterilization on 8,300 people and the laws stayed on the books until 1974. Mr. Kistler died in 2015. It's hard to know what to make of Mr. Kistler and his support for this group, but I try not to judge anyone too harshly. I believe his support of this organization was definitely wrong, and that the Foundation's operating principles have been proven false. But I wasn't a 15-year-old in Switzerland in the 1930s, watching the greatest war machine the world had ever seen be assembled next door. The first Germany, under the National Socialist Party, seemed to be working well. They came out from under crushing debt and devastating inflation to have the strongest economy on earth. They seemed to be winning, and everyone loves a winner. This is the current Queen of England, giving the Nazi salute. This is a meeting of the American Nazi Party in New York. This is Charles Lindbergh, an ardent supporter of the Nazis and Hitler until the war. We all like to think that we would have done the right thing. We would have stood up to Hitler. We would have marched in Selma with Dr. King. We would have fought for the Union during the American Civil War, as one of my ancestors, seen here, did. But most of us would have been shaped by where we were born. Being raised in a racist environment, or knowing that your survival depended on not antagonizing your powerful but insane neighbor, shapes how you think, which helps determine who you are. I can point to the man I showed you earlier and extol the virtue of my ancestors, that this man was raised in the northern United States, where discussing the abolition of slavery was not a crime. This one is also my ancestor. But he was raised in the southern United States, and fought for the Confederacy. We cannot easily know someone's heart, who they might have been, or how they might have thought if raised under different circumstances. We can, however, be sure that our ancestors will look back on our time from a privileged perspective. Let us hope that they don't judge their ancestors, as harshly as we tend to judge ours. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Help us out on Patreon if you can. We appreciate your support. At Astra Proterra.